Oh, hi! You caught me adopting stray cats from outside. I guess I'm just sensitive. Hey, speaking of being sensitive, let's talk about Mr. Sensitive and his team, the Ecstatics. <laughs> Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. In July of 2001, Marvel decided to restart X-Force with a completely different direction. Joe Quesada had recently been appointed the new editor-in-chief, and one of the things he wanted to do was shake up all the X-Men and mutant titles that Marvel had. Grant Morrison began writing new X-Men to great critical acclaim and sales. His fellow British writer, Peter Milligan, was placed on X-Force, and while it had great critical reception, the sales were never quite as hot. Nevertheless, it's one of my personal favorite runs. I want to discuss why today. Let's start with a brief look at its creators, Peter Milligan as the writer and Mad Men creator Mike Allred as the artist. Peter Milligan broke into comics in the early 80s, writing for the popular British title 2000 AD, and began working with DC in the early 90s, at the tail end of the British invasion of writers who began working here in the States. He followed his friend Grant Morrison on Animal Man, rebooted the Steve Ditko creation Shade the Changing Man, wrote the well-reviewed Enigma limited series for Vertigo, and even wrote some Batman stories, pitching an idea that became the Azrael character, who would briefly take over as Batman in the Nightfall storyline. To be clear, I'm not trying to say that Peter Milligan co-created Asriel. The actual story is a little more complex than that. Instead, what happened was Milligan was ending his tenure on Detective Comics and spoke with editor Denny O'Neill and had an idea. He said, I think it would be a cool idea to introduce a character that's more Batman than Batman. And Denny O'Neill took that concept, worked with writers, and they created the Sword of Asriel miniseries and went from there. So, Peter Milligan, as a writer, his sensibilities are not necessarily what you would consider mainstream. Most of his work had been on stuff for Vertigo at DC. And therefore, it was an interesting choice for Joe Quesada to approach Milligan and say, hey, I want you working on one of our X-Men titles, one of our flagship mainstream things. And you know what Milligan's answer was? No. He wasn't interested. He's like, you know what, there's so much continuity, there's so many characters, not really interested. But Casada kept at it, said, come on, come on, I bet you could come up with a good idea. And Milligan's like, all right, you know what, I do have an idea, but I need to level set. I need to basically take everything that's been done before, toss it out, I've got a new idea with new characters. And Casada, to his credit, went for it. Mike Allred was selected to be the artist. His sensibilities lean towards pop art and simple, clean, and expressive line work. His character Madman had been published since 1992, and this would be his first ongoing work for Marvel and his longest work for hire assignment. His frequent colorist and collaborator Laura Allred provided the colors. Milligan's new idea was a team of mutants who were not feared and hated, but were incredibly popular celebrities. But by the end of the first issue, all but one of the team is brutally killed. While the violence in the issue is more satirical than sensationalistic, it was graphic enough that the Comics Code Authority refused to approve the book as is. To their credit, Marvel said, fine, we'll just run it without the Comics Code seal, something they hadn't done on a book since 1971, and that was special circumstances when they decided to run three issues of Spider-Man talking about the dangers of drug use, and the Comics Code wouldn't approve it, and they said, fine, but we think this is an important story, we'll run it without the code. At this point, Marvel's saying, you know what? The Comics Code has run its course. Parents aren't buying comics for the kids looking for that seal of approval, and most of their readership had aged up so that they didn't really care whether that was there or not. So following this, Marvel basically stopped carrying the Comics Code seal of approval on its books shortly after DC dropped it, and then even Archie dropped it. But it all started with X-Force 116. The X-Force team is portrayed as less than noble and mostly performs the work of being superheroes for high-paying clients. They're shallow celebrities that have frequent press conferences, and each member has their own side projects and endorsements. 
The team leader, Zeitgeist, and manager, Coach, are later revealed to have planned the botched ambush to weed out the less popular team members and infuse the team with new blood. There's two things worth mentioning here. First is, this is a book with a very high mortality rate. And I've reviewed in the past books like Strike Force Moratory and Suicide Squad. Those are books where the cast is frequently getting changed up. And X-Force is similar in that regard, but one thing it really has going for it is these are all new characters. So you really have no idea who's safe and who's gonna die in any given issue. There's a lot of turnover there, and it actually makes you invest even more in those characters that survive an issue. You're just like, all right, well, I'm starting to like this one. I hope that they don't buy it next. Uh, the second interesting thing is when you look at it on a surface level, the X-Men books for a long time had all been about Mutants are feared and hated by society, but this is a team of mutants that are huge celebrities. But it really isn't so different. They really are going for the same ideas of peaceful integration between uh, humanity and mutants. Uh, what's different is that it's a more nuanced and of the time approach. Because when you look at the world today, uh, is racism gone? No, absolutely not. At the same time, are there people of color that are massive celebrities because of being an athlete or a musician? No question. Well, this is kind of that same idea. One great aspect of the X-Force run by Milligan and Allred is that it is not interrupted with crossovers, and it tells a complete story across 40 issues. 14 issues of X-Force, and then the team renames itself and the title reboots as X-Statics for a further 26. It also had a five-issue coda. The team's goals shift by the second issue when new team member Mr. Sensitive is added to the team and takes the leadership reins. He is less ruthless than Coach and Zeitgeist and genuinely cares about his team, which in turn earns him their loyalty. That said, the mortality rate is high, and when the book ends, not many are left standing. If you're not already familiar with this book, that may be one reason why. The book does not keep many of its cast members alive by the end. But that's not really the point, whether people live or die. Instead, it's trying to analyze the themes inherent in celebrity. Uh, how celebrity can be used for good or bad. Uh, how being a celebrity worshiper can be dangerous how you have certain responsibilities if you are an icon. That said, you'll end up enjoying the book because you do care about these characters. Some of the key characters include Mr. Sensitive, The Anarchist, You Go Girl, Venus D. Milo, Dead Girl, Fat, and Vivisector, as well as the incredibly strange mutant who serves as the team mascot and cameraman, Dupe. Mr. Sensitive has heightened senses on the level of Daredevil and Wolverine, but they are such that he is in constant pain from external stimuli. For years, he's studied martial arts and meditation to deal with this, which also makes him an incredible fighter. Professor X eventually found him and made him a suit that dampens his sensations. He feels an obligation to Professor X and tries to use his celebrity status to further Professor X's dream of mutant and human collaboration. He also falls for You Go Girl, the only survivor of the original team, but who has multiple issues, including substance abuse. A spoiler here, You Go Girl does eventually die, and that inspires the team to take a more heroic direction and to rename themselves Ecstatics. That was You Go Girl's dying idea. And uh, going forward, that gives a lot of uh, character context for Mr. Sensitive because he really fell for her and now he's starting to fall for the new team teleporter Venus de Milo but he feels guilty for that he feels an obligation to distance himself from his teammates so that he can be an effective leader and there's even some um, romantic triangle stuff going on with the anarchist Venus de Milo and Mr. Sensitive uh, it's really some fantastic character work all around in my personal favorite Mr. Sensitive moment, he has to fight Iron Man. The Avengers eventually want to take Dupe in because he is incredibly powerful, and Ecstatics face off against the team. Mr. Sensitive and Iron Man fight on sacred land run by nudists who demand they take off their clothes. 
Mr. Sensitive is in pain from everything, and Tony Stark doesn't have his suit to help him with his heart condition. An epic battle of mere slaps and shoves takes place. X-Force slash X-Statics is hilarious. It's a really, really funny book. And part of that is thanks to Mike Allred's incredibly expressive artwork. He really sells the emotions uh, on this stuff. It, it's great. Now, he does have a few fill-in artists, but fortunately, they're all fantastic, and they're actually fairly similar in some regards to the style, because you've got guys like Duncan Fogredo, you've got Paul Pope, you've got Darwin Cook, so they're all fantastic. In fact, if there's a bummer in this book, it isn't that there's a fill-in artist, it isn't that you're losing certain characters, it's that Milligan and Allred had a really cool idea that Marvel scuttled at the last possible minute. At one point, the creators planned to have Princess Diana be resurrected and revealed to have mutant powers and join the team. It's perfectly in keeping with the book's themes of celebrity. The team is frequently accused of being famous for being famous, but the UK heard about the idea and Buckingham Palace officially complained. At the last minute, Marvel changed the character's hair color and said she was a late fictional pop star named Henrietta. The arc was changed from the clever Die Another Day to the generic Back from the Dead. The book's personality is all based on the team members. They don't train much, which accounts for their high mortality rate, but they do have interesting powers and personalities. Tyke Alakar is the anarchist who can turn his sweat into acid or glue. He ends up becoming best friends with Mr. Sensitive, but is also rude, brash, and angry. He has a lot of hostility over how black citizens have been treated, and we later learn he was adopted and raised by a white couple, which probably informed his defensiveness. He is also constantly well-groomed, which isn't spelled out, but it makes sense that he's probably also sensitive about the fact that his powers are based on his sweat. Vivisector is an intellectual, and Fat is basically M&M, but both are also gay and end up in a happy relationship for a time. A lot of Peter Milligan's tropes are on display in this title. He frequently has well-rounded gay and trans characters in his titles, like Enigma, Shade the Changing Man, and Infinity Incorporated. He'll subvert genre expectations, and that's on full display with a team of celebrity mutants. He's also known for putting heroes in incredibly tough situations where they have to make impossible moral decisions. In Batman, he had Riddler leave a choking baby that forced Batman to perform a tracheotomy. In Ecstatics, a mutant who could warp reality, but who was mentally unstable and wanted to be part of the team, is welcomed into it by Mr. Sensitive, who then kills him to protect the world. Meanwhile, Mike Allred's retro kitsch artwork that led him to include beatniks in Madman and his book The Atomics results in similarly retro characters like Surrender Monkey and the Oligarchs. He has beautiful redheads in his books, and even Dead Girl share some similarities with his creation Madman. They're both living dead characters with sunken eyes and white suits. Ecstatics can be a dark book in that characters from the team can die in almost every issue, but it's also satirical and funny. It's about something. There's a theme analyzing celebrity culture. One thing that I liked in last week's review of Uncanny X-Force was that it had a complete story, beginning, middle, and end, and it isn't interrupted by crossovers. Well, that's another thing that happens here with the X-Force Ecstatics run. Over 40 issues, and it's not interrupted with any external crossovers or forced guest stars. It takes place in the Marvel Universe, but it does it on its own terms. It tells its own story, so I really like that. And it has an incredibly stable creative team. The same writer and almost all the issues are by Mike Allred with a few others by people that draw in a similar style and are definitely on the same level in terms of talent. So there is a lot to like about this book. It tells an interesting story. If you can find the omnibus collection or the individual issues, it gets a strong recommend from me. That said, let's take a look at what kind of fan art came in this week for the show. First up, Brian Hodge last drew me in my Spider-Sona as Spider-Gwen, and now he has me as Captain Marvel punching an old lady. Interesting pattern forming there. Brian's Insta is listed below. 
James Walsh shows what happens when a litter bug is found by Lady Cop, Infotron, and myself. James's Instagram is also listed. 13-year-old Quinn sends in this awesome piece. He says it was inspired by my show and Peter Tomasi's run on Superman. I haven't read that yet, Quinn, but my 14-year-old nephew also told me it was good. Thank you very much. Clint Williams sends in this cool piece that he says he made with his son's art tools, and Clint's YouTube name is listed there. Ryder Lundquist sends in a piece based on Liefeld's trope of covering up the feet that he draws. You can see more of Ryder's artwork at his Instagram page. Ross Easterby includes this fun piece. I wish I had whatever those powers are. You can see more of Ross's art at his Instagram page. Matrix Smaga returns with a cool piece featuring a hunter tracking me down. Psst, I'm behind the hunter. Finally, viewer Alan Skye liked the episode about What If Comics and decided to include me as a zombie. You can see more of his art on his Instagram. So if this is your first time tuning in, I will always feature any fan art that's related to this show. If you want to include a piece, just send it to this email, comictropes at gmail.com. And uh, I will also draw one winner out of the fan art to win a gotcha punt that I picked up myself in Japan. So... Uh, there are six entrants this time because Maychik has won before and Alan Skye said he didn't need to be included. So I've got six numbers here. I'm going to drop them into the bag and uh, shuffle that around to see who wins. Oh, who won? Who wins? One of those words. Uh, the winner will get the gotcha pawn out of the gotcha pony machine, which was donated to the show by Lunar Shine Store. All right. The winner is number five. And number five was Ryder, Ryder Lundquist. Congratulations, let's take a look at what you won. By the way, if you like the sound quality this week, here's that gotcha pond sound, uh, you need to thank listener, or viewer I should probably say, uh, Craig Kimball. Craig Kimball donated a new uh, audio equipment setup. Uh, I've got an amazing boom mic now, Thank you so much, Craig. Folks, if the sound is better, if it's an improvement, you need to thank Craig for that. All right, looks like this gotcha pawn is uh, One Punch Man. Can you make that out? I don't know if you guys have read the manga or seen the anime One Punch Man. It's a satire of, uh, of action manga. It's pretty darn funny, actually. It's really funny. So, Ryder, that will be coming your way. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Craig Kimball, for the new boom mic. And, um, oh, I know, uh, I've got a new Discord server. So if you would like to talk to me and to other viewers, uh, that's pretty active. I'll put the link below uh, in the description. So uh, that's pretty active. Definitely uh, welcome you to check that out. I've also created some Comic Tropes t-shirts. Uh, they're available from Teespring. You should be able to see the link right below the video if you're watching it on YouTube. And uh, I tried to price though, those uh, really low. So I was just trying to make them affordable, not trying to uh, get rich off of that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. This was part two of X Month. Ooh, very impressive special effects, right? Anyway, come on back next week. We'll have more in the world of the X-Men for you. And until then, keep reading comics.